Hello and welcome to part four of metabolism. Uh, in this section, we're going to look at the final step in uh, central metabolism, respiration and oxidative phosphorylation. And in this particular one, oh, I see a typo here. Let's go ahead and fix that. Uh, where is that? Hello and welcome to part four of cellular metabolism. In this unit uh, or in this lecture, we're going to talk real quick about cellular respiration and oxidative phosphorylation. In part three, we covered the central metabolic pathways, glycolysis, transition step, and Krebs cycle. And all of those uh, different metabolic pathways, their entire one of their primary functions is the oxidation of glucose. We produced lots of energy intermediates. Remember, we produced 10 NADH molecules and two FADH2s. Those molecules are energy intermediates or electron carriers, and their only function is to take electrons from something like a metabolic pathway and transfer those electrons to the electron transport chain in order for oxidative phosphorylation to occur. Now, oxidative phosphorylation can be either aerobic or anaerobic. In either situation, the electron acceptor at the end of the electron transport chain expresses electronegativity or attraction for electrons. And so the greater the electronegativity of the terminal or final electron acceptor, the, the more energy will be given off by electrons as they're moving through the electron transport chain. That in turn will cause those cytochrome complexes in that electron transport chain to pump more protons. The more protons they pump, the greater the proton motive force, the more ATP the electron transport chain can produce. So the electron transport chain starts as a series of proton pumps. These are referred to as cytochromes. Uh, make sure my pen is working here. So these are referred to as uh, cytochromes. I'm having a little lag here, probably because of the video. Um, these cytochromes, I'm sorry you can't read that. Hopefully my pen will catch up quickly. Um, these cytochromes are called proton pumps. Now these proton pumps will harness energy from free electrons and use that energy to pump protons across a, um, a uh, uh, phospholipid bilayer across a cell membrane. Now, remember from the first lecture from part one of this lecture series, proton pumps can be used in a multitude of different ways, right? They can be used for transport. Um, uh, they can be used to create the proton motive force. They have a couple of different functions, particularly in, in prokaryotes. So we're gonna take a look here at a real quick, just a little one minute video on what a proton pump does and how it functions. Pumps are protein complexes that move the protons generated during oxidation reaction. Oh, it stalled on us. We'll try it again. Proton pumps are protein complexes that move the protons generated during oxidation reactions across the cell membrane. As the protons move through the proton pump, they begin to build up on the outside of the membrane. The protons accumulate on the outside of the membrane, creating a concentration gradient. The membrane is not permeable to the charged hydrogen ions, and they cannot diffuse back across the membrane. Instead, they must pass through a special channel. The protons move through this special channel, which is the enzyme, ATP synthase. This enzyme uses the energy derived from the movement of these protons to convert ADP into ATP. The movement of protons down a concentration gradient provides the energy for ATP synthase to form ATP. This mechanism of producing ATP is called chemiosmosis. So that's the basic idea, the general idea of how these proton pumps work. And every time an NADH, right, okay, every time an NADH drops off an electron, that electron as it moves through those proton pumps produces enough energy to um, power ATP synthase to make two and a half ATPs. For every electron dropped off by FADH2, 
we get one and a half ATPs. So the electron transport chain is a little bit different in prokaryotic organisms than it is in eukaryotic organisms. So we're going to look at prokaryotes first, since that's what we study in microbiology. For prokaryotes, we use our electron transport chain for ATP production, and it's also used as an energy source to drive flagella. A final use not listed here but shown on our diagram is it's also used by prokaryotes for active transport. Sometimes hydrogen ions um, are used, protons are used to power the transportation of a molecule back across the membrane. So let's take a look at our electron transport chain. Here we have um, the cytochrome complexes. Remember they are called cytochromes. The cytochrome complexes in an electron transport chain are oftentimes called subunits. So here is subunit one, subunit two, subunit three, and subunit four. Right, so we have four of them here. Well, I'm sorry, um, yeah, subunit three. This is a transport protein, excuse me. So uh, subunit three, we're in prokaryotes. And um, each of these, notice NADH, here's NADH. NADH drops off an electron here at subunit one. Right, so we have subunit one, subunit two, right here, the blue one, and subunit three. Let me start over. Come on. Okay, so now we're taking a look at our electron transport chain. And this is the electron transport chain in prokaryo prokaryotic organisms, prokaryotes in bacteria. And it's uh, just a, a slightly different than what we see in eukaryotes. Uh, for prokaryotes, they use the electron transport chain for a couple of different uses. So they use it, of course, for ATP production. They also use it to power flagella. So if bacteria are motile and have flagella or an axial filament, they will use energy from their electron transport chain to drive the flagella. That is harnessed over here are the uses here are the uses of the proton motor force in prokaryotes. And for rotation of flagella, the um, hydrogen ions move through the basal body, if you remember that from unit one. Uh, proton motor force created by the electron transport chain in bacteria is also used in uh, some forms of active transport. And finally, what we're really looking at is using the proton motor force for ATP synthase, uh, synthesis, or the production of ATP. Now, the, um, in ATP production, what we're looking at here is we have our NADH and FADH2. And if you remember from the previous lecture, NADH and FADH2 are energy intermediates or electron carriers. And their job is to go out to glycolysis Krebs cycle transition step pick up the electrons that are being produced by the oxidation of glucose, right? So th those processes there, they're primarily oxidizing glucose, transferring those electrons, right? Being reduced themselves and then transferring those electrons to the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain consists of a series of proteins known as cytochromes, okay? So it's composed of uh, a class of proteins called cytochromes. And in the electron transport chain, we just simply call these subunits one, two, and three. Now subunits one and two, right, or one and uh, three, excuse me, subunits one and three are proton pumps, like we looked at uh, in that video. And NADH right here drops off its electron at subunit one. When it drops off its electron, it becomes NAD+, and NAD+, will go back into the cell to repeat oxidation again, so to repeat its process, to go pick up electrons and then bring them here and drop them off. 
This subunit one here accepts this electron and electrons, uh, free electrons are very highly excited molecules or uh, subatomic particles. So as that electron is kind of vibrating around in there, the energy being released by it is used by this cytochrome to pump the hydrogen ions or protons. Ubiquinone is a protein within the um, uh, uh, electron transport chain that will grab the electron over here that's in subunit one and transfer it directly to the next proton pump, which is subunit three. So that electron will get moved over here. Subunit three will do the same thing. It will use the energy from this super excited electron and it will uh, uh, use that energy to pump protons across the membrane. At the end of this electron transport chain, eventually, because we're in prokaryotes, this is called the ubiquinol oxidase, this enzyme, or cytochrome C oxidase, will transfer this electron to um, an oxygen atom, as well as two protons will get transferred to that oxygen atom, and we end up with a, a water molecule. Now, this is important because O2, what's really happening is oxygen has a very high electronegativity. And that strong electronegativity, when NADH drops off its electron, there's got to be some kind of incentive or something for that electron to get moved through this electron transport chain. And that is the electronegativity. So really what's happening is um, I always imagine it's a silly uh, analogy, but if I were an oxygen atom uh, here or an oxygen molecule here at the end of the electron transport chain, I'm over here, I'm going to throw a rope or a lasso around my electron and it's literally pulling these electrons through the electron transport chain. As they get pulled through the electron transport chain by the electronegativity of oxygen, they release energy. That energy released is used by the proton pumps to, um, to, to pump protons and create a high concentration of protons on this side of the membrane over here, right? So I have all these hydrogen ions out here and I end up with a high concentration of these. Now, once um, NADH drops off its electron, again, it goes out and collects more. One uh, molecule that's not shown here is FADH2. Now, FADH2 drops off its electron here at uh, subunit 2. And because it drops off its subunit 2, its electron will only power one cytochrome instead of two, which is why it produces less ATP. Uh, because it's, they're counting the number of hydrogen ions that are getting moved across the membrane, getting pumped. So now that we have this high concentration gradient of protons on this side of the membrane, they want to get to the other. I have a higher concentration of protons on the outside of the membrane than I do on the inside of the membrane. So down here I have a low hydrogen ion concentration. Because of that, my protons want to diffuse across the membrane but the membrane is a phospholipid bilayer, so they are unable to do that. So ATP synthase is an enzyme that provides a channel or a way for these protons to diffuse back across the membrane. And as they diffuse through ATP synthase, because they are charged, they too will give off energy. That energy will be harnessed by ATP synthase, and that energy will be used to convert ADP into ATP. So for every NADH that gets drop, dropped off, we can produce three ATP. Here we have the electron transport chain in eukaryotic organisms. And in eukaryotes, we use our electron transport chain strictly for ATP synthase. We do not use it for transport, and of course we don't use it for flagella. Uh, also, in the eukaryotic electron transport chain, we have four subunits instead of three. So here is complex one or subunit one, here is two, here's three, and then here is four. We are not using this to drive flagella, so we don't have a, any basal body that would uh, replace that. So that's what this um, uh, subunit here is. And of course, in our cells, we use oxygen as our terminal electron acceptor.
During glycolysis and the tricarboxylic acid cycle, oxidation of organic molecules results in production of reduced coenzymes such as NADH. These coenzymes transfer hydrogens to the electron transport chain, which is located in the bacterial cell membrane. A hydrogen consists of a proton and an electron. The electron transport chain consists of a series of special electron carrier proteins that shuttle electrons from NADH to a terminal electron acceptor, such as oxygen. Electrons enter the electron transport chain when NADH transfers its protons plus electrons to a membrane-embedded carrier protein. The electrons are sequentially carried along the electron transport chain while the protons are shuttled to the outside of the membrane. Some of the electron carriers, such as coenzyme Q, accept a proton from the inside of the cell membrane as it accepts electrons. The proton is then transported through the membrane as electrons move down the chain. This increases the proton gradient across the membrane and enhances the proton motive force. During aerobic respiration, the last carrier protein transfers a pair of electrons to oxygen at the end of the electron transport chain and water is formed. The enzyme ATP synthase utilizes the energy of the proton motive force to synthesize ATP. This enzyme allows protons to pass back into the cell and couples the energy released in this process to the phosphorylation of ADP to form ATP. So there's a nice animation. This animation is also available in your textbook for the um, for viewing on uh, during the, the electron transport chain. So let's take a look at our metabolic accounting and look at our final ATP yield, including um, uh, where we get all of these numbers from. So here on the left, from glycolysis, uh, there I get 2 NADH. Now I'm looking at my metabolic accounting in terms of my electrons moving over into an electron transport chain. So in glycolysis, if I get 2 NADH from glycolysis, then I can produce 6 ATP. If I get 2 NADH from the transition step, I can produce another 6 ATP. In the tricarboxylic acid cycle, or TCA cycle, Krebs and citric acid, um, I get 6 NADH for a total of 18 ATP. But I also get 2 FADH2s. And because they drop off at subunit 2 instead of subunit 1, I get just a little bit less ATP for each of these energy intermediates. So here I get 4. If I add my 12, my 18, and my 4 together, I get a total um, ATP yield of approximately 34 ATP. So when you hear that um, anywhere from 30, usually it's 32 to 36, or sometimes uh, some books will tell you 34 to 38 ATP. And this is because this whole uh, 2 per, or 3 per NADH and 2 per FADH2 is an estimate. So this is where we get our final ATP yield of 32 to 36 ATP per glucose molecule. So in review, these are just some questions again. Um, at the end of the lecture, I like to give you a couple of review questions that you should ask yourself. These are the types of questions, again, you'll see on the exam, um, and they're concepts that are important. I will hopefully see you all in the next one, part five.